So today our uh, speaker is uh, Richard Miller, and uh, he's just setting up his his talk here. And uh, what, what he did is he served on the Polaris submarine, and I think he had a lot of free time to think because he uh, he really came up with some good ideas. I think he's a secular humanist, and I think uh, got his head on straight, probably because he had a lot of time. Uh, to, to, to think about it. Uh, he's, he's been a teacher of high-tech industries. Uh, he's been a progressive secularist by joining a number of organizations in the Phoenix area and uh, has been very active in, in those as well as a member in, in others. Uh, he comes basically highly recommended with accolades from the Phoenix area. He's given talks to the groups up there and uh, that's how we got heard about him that that he was doing such a great job of doing that. So we're more than happy to have him uh, down here to give us a talk today. And he's going to tell us why the separation of church and state is so very important to us. And it's one of our main things that we uh, want to do here as an organization is to maintain that separation. Uh, they're chipping away at the wall all the time. And I think that's uh, very harmful to our uh, overall well-being because we'll all be Christian-like if we're not uh, careful. Some of us don't care to do that. Uh, so uh, he's, um, he wants to also tell us about why we have every right to insist that the uh, separation of church and state is within our rights. So let's give him a big hand here for Richard <clears throat> Miller. <clears throat> Vice President of Americans United for Separation of Church and State in Phoenix. Our President is here, Ann Mardik, sitting right over there. And Ann is going to go over the table outside. She can be brought a lot of literature. We also, if you're interested in joining or just getting on our email list, we have a sign up sheet out there. And something you may really be interested in, I think you're probably all aware that citizens are allowed to comment, and even in person, at the state legislature. But in order to do that, you have to have an account. And in order to establish a, an account, you have to go to the state house, state capitol. Uh, they have little kiosks, and you have to go there locally and sign up, get a user ID, password, etc. And for you guys, that's quite a trip. So we have some Alice sign-up sheets. So if you win, we have them available out at the table, and if you will fill these out for us very carefully and in nice penmanship, because I have to do this, I will then take them down to the state house and establish an account for you and email you with your uh, account information, just to make it simpler for you, okay? Now, I'm gonna to talk today about why church-state separation and why support that separation. Well, <coughs> <clears throat> Initially, in the United States, it was referred to as freedom of conscience. And we'll see George Washington use that term. That was a big term. Freedom of conscience was, was important to those who actually founded the nation. And the reason is that government support corrupts religion. When government and religion merge, in fact, they can corrupt each other. And they do corrupt each other. So government support corrupts religion, and religious strictures corrupt government. Separation of church and state guarantees <coughs> diversity and pluralism, and I think most of us think those are, are good ideas. And a, an important issue in church-state separation is the lessons of history. When we have united government and religion, it hasn't worked out well. It universally decreases overall individual liberty. You can't increase individual liberty by being partial to a particular group. And the, the most important reason church-state separation is absolutely required by the 14th Amendment, by the Constitution in general, but specifically by the 14th Amendment, which may come as a surprise. Most people think that the freedom of religion was established in the First Amendment, in the Bill of Rights, when the Constitution was ratified in 1791. Not true. We didn't really have separation of church and state as an established concept 
surprisingly, until 1947. And then, due to the passage of the 14th Amendment in 1868, we're going to talk about all that. This is an important point. The last time church and state were merged, were one, we were burning people at the state. And it wasn't all that long ago. There are, there are even rumors, uh, I've never been able to, to substantiate it, that some people were burned at the stake in the United States for being witches, etc. in the 1790s. Um, I don't know that that's true, but we certainly know that the, the, the Spanish had auto de fe's here. And uh, of course, in Europe, a lot of people were burned at the stake. And again, it was at least surprising to me, there are people currently, right now, in the United States, that would reinstitute burning at the stake for religious offenses, including, as we'll see, blasphemy. Now, they can't quite make up their minds whether they should burn you at the stake or stone you. And there are a few radicals that even favor hanging, but they're not considered mainstream. Thank goodness. <laughs> So, how is it possible to increase liberty and justice for all if the government supports the religion and thus the religious strictures of less than all its citizens? Okay, you can't guarantee liberty and justice for all by supporting a few. And liberty and justice for all requires that the government be completely neutral on religion. Again, that term liberty of conscience and here's an example of it. This is a quote from George Washington. If I could conceive that the general government might ever be so administered as to render the liberty of conscience insecure, I beg you will be uh, persuaded that no one would be more zealous than myself to establish effectual barriers against the horrors of spiritual tyranny and every species of religious persecution. Okay, that was Washington, that was a long time ago. How about something more current? Well, Ronald Reagan. We establish no religion in this country. We command no worship. We mandate no belief, nor will we ever. Church and state are and must remain separate. Now, I realize that Reagan is no longer even in favor because he was too moderate with, <laughs> with one of our major political parties, but nevertheless, he made that state. I want to talk for a minute about the religious right in America as it's constituted now. There is a concept, uh, or a group actually, this is a formal group, and they call themselves Christian Reconstructionists, and their, their philosophy is Reconstructionism. It was founded by a man named uh, Rushduni, Rousus John Rushduni. He wrote an 800-page tome the Institute of Biblical Law, proving that we were founded as a Christian nation and on biblical principles. And his idea is that Old Testament law should literally be applied to modern society, meaning as its constitution. He wants to, well, he's dead now. He wanted to get rid of the constitution, tear it up, and simply replace it with biblical law. And under such a system, the list of civil crimes which carry the death penalty, these guys are serious, which carry the death penalty include homosexuality, adultery, public blasphemy, although in their defense, they will not execute you for blasphemy until your third offense. <laughs> so if you say, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, it's either you're stoning or burning. Lying about one's virginity, no comment. <laughs> Witchcraft, idolatry or apostasy, incest, bestiality, false prophesying, kidnapping, rape, and bearing false witness in a capital crime, all carry the death sentence. Now, this is Rush Dooney's son-in-law, Gary North. This guy's still around. He's the head of the organization. There aren't many of them, but they're very well funded, and they're, they have a lot of very high level supporters uh, and uh, a lot of money. And uh, North says, the long-term goal of 
Christians in politics should be to gain exclusive control over the franchise. Those who refuse to submit publicly to the eternal sanctions of God by submitting to his church's public uh, marks of the covenant, baptism and holy communion, must be denied citizenship. And he means denied terminally. He didn't say it, but he really does want to execute those who won't get in line. This is God's world, not Satan's. Christians are the lawful heirs, not non-Christians. Now, they have influence disproportionate to their numbers. They have the ear of a lot of important people, like the C Street family, etc. Uh, they are advocating very strongly the growth of Christian homeschooling. There's a lot of support for homeschooling now, and the idea behind that is so that you can educate your kids in their religious philosophy, biblical liberalism, etc. And they seek independence from direct oversight or support of the civil government. This quote is from a very good book called Good News Club by Catherine Stewart. We had her come and uh, speak to do a book signing in Phoenix. This Good News Club, uh, and it's it, they, it was a, a Supreme Court case where the Supreme Court said, yes, the Good News Club can do its thing. They come into schools either before or after on what's called non-contract time when the teachers aren't actually teaching. And they say that they're going to teach the children good morals, etc. What they teach instead is biblical literacy, creationism, etc. And one of their ideas is actually to completely destroy the public school system. They want to go either homeschooling, charter schools, or whatever where they can, with using government funds, teach religion. There's another group on the Christian right. It's not a formal group. It doesn't have a president, a board of directors, etc. But it is a collection of all of those. The term dominionism was coined by a journalist, Sarah Diamond. And she uses that to identify all of those who support the ideas of dominionism. Dominionism, well, in Genesis 1, 28, there is a verse which says that we humans shall have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and all living things. And they've sort of taken that to an extreme. So dominionists include all those who celebrate Christian nationalism in that they believe that the United States once was and should be or must be again a Christian nation. And they promote religious supremacy. They generally do not respect the equality of other religions, certainly, and even not other brands of Christianity. If you are a liberal Christian, you can't be a dominionist. And they endorse theocratic visions. They believe that the Ten Commandments, or biblical law, should be the foundation of American law and that the U.S. Constitution should be seen as a vehicle for implementing biblical principles. And not long ago, four members of the Supreme Court were dominionists. Now, their idea is called theonomy rather than theocracy. Dominion theology is the belief that the law of God, as codified in the Bible, should exclusively govern society to the exclusion of secular law. And a quote from Pat Robertson, there will never be world peace until God's house and God's people are given their rightful place of leadership at the top of the world. And notice he doesn't say United States, he says the world. Now, they want to establish the Ten Commandments as the law of the land, but there's a little difficulty with that. This is only two sets, there are others. But this is, gen this is roughly Protestant and Catholic. The Protestant over here, and the primary difference is that the second commandment for the Protestants says you may not make graven images. But the Catholics are very big on graven images, the cross and Jesus on the cross and Mary and the saints, etc. So they, they said, well, Exodus 20 isn't really correct on this. The Ten Commandments come from chapter 20 of the book of Exodus. So they, they changed it and in the Catholic Ten Commandments, they have deleted that Second Commandment entirely and replaced it with, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. So if you're going to establish the Ten Commandments, 
as secular law, and then obviously the Jewish religion has a third set of Ten Commandments. So which set of Ten Commandments are you going to use? Poses a problem. Now let's go back to the founding of the United States. We'll, we hear a lot about from the religious right that, that the United States was founded as a religious nation. And one of the documents that they quote on this is the Mayflower Compact in 1620 when the pilgrims got here. They didn't wind up in the right place. They were a couple of states north of where they were supposed to be, and they didn't really have a charter for where they were, so they wrote one. They called it the Mayflower Compact. And this obviously is the actual document. If I can find my button. This is the actual document, but it says, having undertaken for the glory of God, and advancement of the Christian faith and honor of our king and country, etc., etc. So they say, ah, right there. Plain language, they established it as a Christian nation. Well, they weren't establishing a nation. They were establishing a colony. And actually, that colony was a commercial venture. They had investors. They had loans that they had to repay, and they did, but it took them decades. But this was a profit-making venture. <laughs> they were not establishing a country. And no Supreme Court decision has ever said, oh, that violates the Mayflower Compact. <laughs> now, the original 13 colonies along the coast, they were sort of divided roughly into three groups. Uh, in green, the New England colonies were largely Puritans. Puritans were the first of the pilgrims <coughs> that came over on the Mayflower. <coughs> and then the rest of, uh, that came later were referred to as Puritans and became Congregationalists, which is still around. They led very strict lives. Middle colonies were a mixture of religions, Quakers, primarily in Pennsylvania, Catholics, Lutherans, a few Jews, and some others. And then the southern colonies down here had a mixture of religions, including Baptists, and some Anglicans. So in the 1600s, when these colonies were being founded, most of them, most of the colonies were founded with religious establishment. There was a Quaker colony or Quaker colonies and Puritan colonies, etc. Uh, with the exception of Rhode Island, when uh, Rhodes went up to Rhode Island, he was thrown out of Massachusetts. Uh, he was not a preacher; he was an educator. And he had some what they considered liberal ideas and forced him out. And he went up and founded Providence Plantation, which became Rhode Island, with established, with no established religion or uh, religious freedom. Now, colonies sometimes refused entry to those of other faiths. And they fined, whipped, imprisoned, exiled, oh, and for some reason it didn't get in here, killed, they executed. Troublemakers. As a matter of fact, they executed they executed four Quakers on Boston Common, one of whom was a woman, for the uh, only for the crime of being told to leave and leaving and coming back. And they came back with their Quaker ideas, which were not suitable, and they were executed. They were hung. And in Virginia, a hot iron bodkin was pushed through the tongue for blasphemy but not until the second offense. <laughs> and so I wondered, what's a bodkin? I pictured a needle, and I found a picture of one. That's a bodkin. So they would heat that thing red hot and shove it through your tongue. Now, to me, this whole idea of the United States being founded as a Christian nation is based on semantics, on an ambiguity. The United States was founded as a nation by a predominantly Christian populace. Okay? Christianity is not codified in our Constitution. We're going to take a look at the Constitution. Uh, as citizens, we have no God-given rights. We have no Christian duties okay, that, that are spelled out by the Constitution or even state law for that fact. As I'm sorry, and the president is not the nation's pastor. Both the Democratic and Republican parties were founded by predominantly Christian constituents, but that doesn't mean they were founded as Christian political parties, some evidence to the contrary. Neither has ever incorporated the Biblical Ten Commandments in their platform. So the U.S. is culturally Christian, but it is not legally Christian. 
Christian, and that's a significant difference. To put it simply, an entity founded by a predominantly sectarian group is not necessarily a sectarian entity, okay? General Motors, found most of the founders of General Motors were good Christians, probably. But it's not a Christian corporation, nor is GE and on down the line. Universities, probably mostly founded by good Christians, but they're not necessarily Christian universities. Social societies, Red Hat Club, I imagine most of the ladies in the Red Hat Club are good Christian women, but it's not a Christian society. Okay? It's, a, it's a, just a social society. Now, let's take some constitutional examples. This is Saudi Arabia's constitution. Article 1, and Saudi Arabia obviously is a Muslim nation. Article 1, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia is a sovereign Arab Islamic state with Islam as its religion, God's book and the Sunnah of his prophet, God's prayers and peace be upon him, are its constitution. Arabic is its language, etc. So Saudi Arabia is legally a Muslim nation. And Sharia law is codified as the Arabic constitution. Now, the, what we refer to as the founders, or sometimes the framers, the 55 guys who wrote the Constitution in 1787, those founders were at least as intelligent as the guys who wrote the <laughs> Arabic Constitution. Okay. So if it was their intent to found a Christian nation, they knew how to do it by simply saying in Article 1 of our Constitution, the United States is founded as a Christian nation. But they didn't do that. They didn't do that because they didn't want to. A few of them probably did, but they certainly have, could not have gotten a consensus on that. Okay. Now, here's Turkey's constitution. And we tend to think of Turkey as a Muslim nation. Almost everyone in Turkey is Muslim. And here's Article 2 of the Turkish constitution. The Republic of Turkey is a democratic, secular, and social state governed by the rule of law, etc., etc. So, Turkey is a culturally Muslim nation, just as the United States is a culturally Christian nation. But we were not founded as a Christian nation, as was Arabia. Now, one document that the religious right never talks about is they talk about Certainly the Mayflower Compact, there's another one called the uh, Mayflower, I'm sorry, the uh, Northwest Ordinance, which uh, gave a section of land in each township that was set aside for religious purposes. Uh, and they quote that and they say that the Declaration of Independence uh, is a founding document. It is, this country was founded on one document, the Constitution. So we're going to take a look. Well, and the Treaty of Tripoli is one that they never mentioned because as the government of the United States is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion and as it has itself no character of enmity, etc. But those, that's the important point. So, this treaty of Tripoli, here's the details, it was signed at Tripoli on November 4, 1796, the U.S. and the Barbary Pirates, submitted to the Senate by Unitarian President John Adams, that's important, John Adams didn't believe in Jesus, he was a Unitarian. He didn't believe in Jesus as, as being uh, divine. And he had been a Unitarian since at least 1760 when he signed the book. And the Treaty of Tripoli was unanimously ratified by the U.S. Senate on June 7, unanimously ratified, June 7, 1797, and signed by President Adams taking effect at, as the law of the land on June 10, 1797, the six years after our Constitution was ratified. But the religious right doesn't like to even acknowledge the Treaty of Tripoli. And then add a statement to go with it. It, it simply reinforces the idea that the, the treaty has been ratified and we must accept, ratify, and confirm the same and every clause and article thereof, including Article 11, where we were not in any sense founded as a Christian nation. So, so far, we've seen the reasons for supporting separation of church and state it simply doesn't work well. Some presidential quotes supporting it. The insidious, and to me they truly are, aims of the religious right to codify 
biblical law and the Ten Commandments as our Constitution. The confusion of, of founding by and founding as, the, the difference, the semantic difference there that's crucially important. And examples of secular and non-secular constitutions, they're really easy to do. And the Treaty of Tripoli. Now, let's get to the important part. What does our Constitution say about separation of church and state? Well, this isn't directly about separation of church and state, but it's important. This is Article 2, Section 1 concerning the oath of office, and it says, notice, before he, there was no idea of a woman even being allowed to vote, much less to hold office. Abigail Adams pleaded with John Adams, you know, please remember to give us some women's rights. And he said, well, that's sweet, dear, but no, I don't think we'll do that. Okay, before he enter on the execution of his office, he shall make the following oath or affirmation. Now, atheists say, ah, they were thinking of us. They said, you don't have to take an oath, you can affirm. Actually, they weren't. They didn't contemplate an atheist really taking an office either, but Quakers weren't allowed to swear. There may have been some other sects. So, uh, as, a, as a sop to them, they said, well, you guys, since it's against your religion, if a, if a Quaker is elected, he can take an affirmation, yeah, he, not she, can take an affirmation rather than an oath. Okay. And then I will faithfully execute, etc. And the phrase, so help me God, does not appear in the oath. And there's some controversy. Some people say Washington added it, and others say no, he didn't, and no one knows for certain. Now, most presidents do say it when they're sworn in, but not all. Uh, it does not appear, and the Bible is not required. You don't, you don't have to swear your oath or affirmation on the Bible. We'll see an example of that in a minute. John Quincy Adams, for instance, was sworn in using the book of the law instead of the Bible because he wanted to maintain the separation of church and state. Now, Article 6, no religious test. So here is one of the few places in the Constitution where religion is mentioned, but it's mentioned as being excluded rather than included. Article 6, the senators and representatives before mentioned and members of the several state legislatures and all executive and judicial officers, both of the United States and of the several states, shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution but no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust. And that's pretty explicit. Even though Texas and some other states are trying to include oath, oath, religious oaths of office. Now, another thing that guarantees the separation of church and state is that we are a government of enumerated powers. Those 55 guys in the summer of 1787 made a list. This is because they were afraid that the federal government was going to become too strong. So they made a list. They sat down and said, what do we want the federal government to be able to do? Okay. And they came up with these 21 items. And these are all that, that the federal government is permitted to do. Okay. You can read them for yourselves. I'm not going to read them. But I particularly like number eight, promote science and the useful arts. So religion isn't mentioned, but science is. And then there's sort of a controversial one over uh, number 18, make necessary and proper laws. And some people really try and stretch that. But those necessary and proper laws are supposed to refer only to these enumerated powers and not to expand them. Now, let's take a look at constitutional amendments. That's, that's we've just seen pretty much everything that the Constitution itself uh, refers to uh, concerning religion. But the First Amendment, con Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging freedom of speech, etc. Well, at Americans United for Separation of Church and State, we're just worried about that initial part. Two clauses, 16 words. Con well, Congress is underlined because that was the, con the first Congress, and Congress could make no law. What that meant in practice was that the Bill of Rights did not apply to the states. It applied only to the U.S. Congress. 
So the U.S. Congress could not restrict your freedom of religion or your freedom of press or whatever, but the states could, surprisingly. So Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. That in red is the establishment clause. Or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That's the free exercise clause. So the establishment clause was, and the term is incorporated, meaning it was meant now by a Supreme Court decision to apply to each state in addition to the federal government. And that didn't happen until 1947, okay? In a case called Cantwell versus Connecticut, Justice Hugo Black, and we'll see this a little more closely in a minute, incorporated the establishment clause, said that no state may establish a religion. But that didn't happen until 1947. Free exercise clause, a little earlier, 1940, in a, in a case called Everson versus the Board of Education. but. According to this, you could have in a state an established religion up until 1947. And you, and you might not have free exercise until 1940. And until the 14th Amendment, which was ratified in 1868, the First Amendment and the entire Bill of Rights applied only to the federal government. And that was due to, in the, in the uh, uh, ratification process, the southern states' insistence on states' rights. Still a contentious issue. Now, <clears throat> Madison originally opposed the Bill of Rights. As a matter of fact, almost the entire Constitutional Convention of 55 guys, most of the 55 guys weren't, either weren't there or weren't active. It was really a group of about a dozen that, that wrote this thing and got it passed. But Madison and some others originally opposed the Bill of Rights. They said it isn't necessary. We've got enumerated powers. And religion is not an enumerated power, et cetera. But in the process of ratification, after they had the Congress, or the framers, had completed the Constitution and sent it to the states for ratification, the states said, no, no, we want a Bill of Rights. Uh, and so Madison drafted the Bill of Rights in 1789 based on 210 amendments and principles from the various states. Now, I've got Rhode Island separated out. There were 39 others uh, principles and amendments from Rhode Island. And I separated that because Rhode Island did not take part, did not take part, didn't send delegates to the Constitutional Convention. They just said, no, you guys, you know, we're not, we're not worried about it. Do what you want to do. Now, nine of the 13 states' conventions demanded no establishment. That is, they, as they demanded church-state separation as a, as a basis for their ratification. They would not ratify unless church-state separation were incorporated. The first U.S. Congress, the, what we call the Framers, rewrote and approved the Bill of Rights, and then uh, in September, September 28, 1787, they sent the Constitution out with the Bill of Rights out to the, uh, to the states. And the states began ratifying. So Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, et cetera, Connecticut. And then we got to Massachusetts, and it ratified, but 187 for, 168 against. So just a few votes would have changed that. Rhode Island. <laughs> They, they weren't really taking part, but they had a public referendum and 237 for and 2,700 against. Then Maryland ratified, and that was pretty decisive, South Carolina, and then New Hampshire. And that's significant because you needed nine states to ratify in order for the U.S. to become a nation, for the Constitution to go into effect, and for us to become the United States of America. So initially, we were the nine United States of America. But they wanted to get everybody. You don't want to leave a hole in the country. If New York didn't ratify, it might uh, establish treaties or alliances with foreign powers, be invaded by a foreign power, whatever. Okay. So you wanted everyone to sign up. And you know, this is post-ratification. We are now a country, and we have nine states. But then Virginia and New York, they've noticed 34, 27 against, very close. 
North Carolina adjourned without ratifying. March 4th, and I had never known this until I was doing this research, I knew that Texas had once been in its own country, but I didn't know that any other state had. But both Rhode Island and North Carolina declared themselves to be independent nations, and they created a flag and, and flew it. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, they said, we'll ratify once the Bill of Rights is actually in. And Rhode Island ratifies 34 for 32 against after the Bill of Rights was included. So Madison prop then proposed that the Bill of Rights apply to the states. He wanted incorporation right then. So this is the law of the land, not only for the federal government, but for each of the state governments. And that was approved by the House, but rejected by the Senate. Again, the Southern Senate. Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Virginia, and New York conventions conditioned ratification. They said, okay, we'll ratify now before you actually do it, but on, with the gentleman's agreement, the understanding that you will include a Bill of Rights. And one of the things that is frequently mentioned when people talk about uh, the amendments and whether we are founded as a Christian nation and whether a particular issue is constitutional is original intent. And by that, they typically mean the, the intent of the founders or framers. There's a slight difference there. For instance, Jefferson was a founder, certainly, but he wasn't a framer. He was the ambassador to France. He was in Paris during the Constitutional Convention, so he didn't directly help frame the Constitution. At any rate, it was clearly the original, or the original intent of the first Congress framers, the guys who wrote it, that the Bill of Rights did not extend to the states. That was just a fundamental agreement. It applied only to the federal government. They wanted to limit the power of the federal government. Until the 14th Amendment, states were free to keep or make laws concerning establishment of religion. And not just that. That's, that's our issue with Americans United. But they were free to restrict freedom of the press, right to trial by jury, anything guaranteed in the Bill of Rights, states could infringe. For instance, uh, in the South, it was a felony to write or say anything against slavery. It was a felony. They would imprison you. And even if someone in a northern state wrote or said something against slavery, the southern states would indict them and try to uh, extradite them. Mass sailors from Massachusetts who had committed no <laughs> crime when they went into Carolina were jailed simply on the premise that they would say something uh, anti-slavery. So if they came ashore from their ship, they went straight to jail and they stayed there until the ship was sailed. <laughs> and even though, and everyone thinks that we all got freedom of religion, freedom of press, etc., in uh, 1791 when the Constitution was ratified with the Bill of Rights in it, not true. Uh, although all states eventually, and, and uh, on their own volition, voluntarily, disestablished their state religions over time, the last one was Massachusetts in 1833. So it was Congregationalist until 1833. Now, the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution says, nor shall any person be deprived of life, liberty, property, etc., without due process of law, but it applied only to the federal government. Until Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, and it says, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property, okay? So until we ratified the 14th Amendment, states did not guarantee life, liberty, or uh, property, etc. They didn't have to because the Bill of Rights didn't apply to them. Now, I mentioned the 14th Amendment. It was written in 1886 and ratified in 18, uh, I'm sorry, 1866 and ratified in 1868 just after the Civil War. And there's a reason for that. When the states seceded from the United States, left the country, left the United States, they were no longer states, and then the South lost the Civil War, naturally those states wanted to be readmitted. And the Congress said, no, we're not going to just automatically readmit you and let all of those Southern senators and representatives come back with the same old ideas. So instead, those southern states, the states which had seceded, 
were divided up into five military districts and were controlled by the military and had no representation in Congress, which was valid because they were not states. They had voluntarily uh, seceded from the Union. So, but after the Civil War, slavery was no longer an issue. States' rights were less of an issue because we didn't have all of those Southern uh, politicians in Congress. And we had decided pretty self uh, decisively that secession was no longer a possibility. And Congress was a Republican supermajority. But at that time, the Republicans were the liberals, <laughs> strangely enough. Democrats were conservative. Well, you remember the term Southern Democrat. Okay. And those <coughs> seceded states had not been readmitted. So the House was 79% Republican or liberal. The Senate was 77% Republican. So it was a supermajority. They could do anything they wanted. They could create an amendment. They could override a uh, veto, whatever they wanted. As a matter of fact, they uh, impeached President Johnson who was working against them, trying to get those southern states readmitted immediately. Now, let's take a look at the 13th and 14th Amendment. The, the 13th doesn't really have anything to do with what I'm talking about today, but it amazed me when I was reading this. This is what I thought the 13th Amendment said. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery, right? So you would expect it to say, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States, etc. Here's what it really says. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted. So, according to the 13th Amendment, in theory at least, slavery is still a possibility in the United States. I think it would probably be cruel and unusual. Maybe not in Mississippi, but... <laughs> okay. Uh, now, the issue here was that the 13th Amendment uh, granted citizenship to the freed slaves. That was pretty explicit. They were now citizens, and some say, some say it was the only purpose. It did not grant them the right to vote, etc. Okay. But then came the 14th Amendment, and this is section 1 of the 14th Amendment. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of any of the citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction equal protection of the law. So now, the Bill of Rights, according to the 14th Amendment, it's pretty explicit, the Bill of Rights incorporates all of those freedoms in the Bill of Rights, I'm sorry, the 14th Amendment incorporates the entire Bill of Rights into state government not just the federal government. And that, that yeah, the legal word for that is incorporation. Here's the man who wrote the 14th Amendment. His name is John Bingham. He was a Republican congressman from Ohio, and he was a heavyweight. He was the judge advocate in the trial of Abraham Lincoln, or the assassination. He was the prosecutor in the impeachment trials of Andrew Johnson. Johnson was acquitted by one vote, that of Edmund Ross. Just a little trivia. And Bingham was the principal found framer of the 14th Amendment and wrote Section 1. He not only wrote it, Bingham read into the congressional record in their entirety the first eight amendments. He stood up and read the first eight amendments into the congressional record and then declared his intention that the 14th Amendment was designed to protect all such privileges and immunities. And the Congress then passed it, and the states ratified it. House passed it 128 to 37, then they made some changes, and uh, uh, the Senate amended, uh, uh, approved the amended version by 33 to 11. The House then approved the amended, amended version, 120 to 32, pretty decisively. And it was ratified by 27 of the then 38 states and became the law of the land. Okay, almost. Because, despite Bingham's intention that the 14th Amendment incorporated the entire Bill of Rights, the Supreme Court said, no, I don't think so. And they said it multiple times. Two big cases. One was called Slaughterhouse and the other Crookshank. And uh, 
They then became the law of the land, starting decisis, it has been decided and it should not be changed, that the Bill of Rights was simply not incorporated by the 14th Amendment. I don't know how they arrived at that thought, but they did. And it remained that way until uh, what we saw in 1940 for the uh, free expression. And in 1947, in the case of Adamson versus California, Supreme Court uh, Justice Black argued in his dissent that the 14th Amendment framers had in intended incorporation and attached a lengthy appendix that quoted extensively from Bingham's congressional testimony. And then in another case, which we saw earlier, Everson versus Board of Education, and as a majority, the First Amendment has erected a wall of separation, Jefferson and before him, uh, uh, Rhodes, I'm sorry, Williams, right, Williams. That wall must be kept high and impregnable. We could not approve the slightest breach. Although New Jersey has not breached it here. Now, what, that was 9-0. That wall of separation that was unanimous by the Supreme Court. This case was about a guy complained that public school buses were transporting children to parochial schools. Okay, and he said, that's, uh, that's unconstitutional. And they decided, yes, that, that is, well, we are going to establish the principle that uh, the wall of separation is incorporated. The establishment clause is incorporated into the states, but New Jersey didn't do it here. It's okay for the state to, to bus kids to parochial school. Okay, and that overturned those earlier cases, Crookshank and, and Slaughterhouse. Now, then Justice Rehnquist came up with a different theory, Wallace versus Jaffrey in 1985. He said the establishment clause did not require government neutrality between religion and irreligion, meaning non-religion, atheism even, uh, providing that it was non-discriminatory, or his phrase was non-preferential. Okay? So the government can aid religion, but it has to aid all of them equally. Well, looking on the internet, it, you can't get a clear answer. It's somewhere between 1,000 and 3,000 different religious groups in the United States. So it would be difficult to aid each of those non-preferentially. <clears throat> and he also said there's no historical foundation for incorporating the Bill of Rights or building that wall of separation. He admitted the Establishment Clause incorporation by Everson, but, and he was refuted by Justice Souter and Douglas Laycock, who's a, a constitutional scholar. Anyway, some people still talk about uh, Rehnquist's no preference theory. That's the way the government can support religion. It just has to support all of them equally, non-preferentially. But he didn't do his research. In the original uh, framers, the original uh, constitutional process, three non-preferential uh, wordings were disapproved. Congress shall make no law establishing one religious sect or society in preference to others. Congress shall not make any law in the rights of conscience or establishing any religious sect, or Congress shall make no law establishing any particular denomination of religion. And all three of those were voted against. Okay? So they were not put in the Constitution, so that pretty much shoots down Rehnquist's theory. And then comes Justice Thomas. Now this wasn't part of an official, this, a formal decision, it was a personal comment. But Justice Thomas did some research in a case called New Doubt, and he said the text and history of the Establishment Clause strongly suggest that it is a federalism provision, meaning applying only to the Congress, to the federal government, and is intended to prevent Congress from interfering with state establishments. So he wanted to go back to states can just trample all over your rights because the Bill of Rights applies only to Congress. The Establishment Clause does not purport to protect individual rights, and it makes little sense to incorporate it. And that's just law. Okay. Uh, but again, that was a personal statement. Not, he didn't write that in his dissent. He was refuted by legal scholar Akhil Reed Amar, who teaches constitutional law at, at Yale. Um, 
to the extent that a state created a coercive establishment, meaning favoring, saying, you know, you have to uh, abide by these religious laws, decreeing that individual profess a state creed or attend a state service or pay money directly to a state church, such coercion would implicate bodily liberty and property of discrete individuals. So that's uh, refuted as well. So what did we learn? We were founded by a predominantly sectarian group, but that does not necessarily mean we were founded as a sectarian entity. There's a big difference there. Okay, the east coast of North America was settled as a series of colonies, some of which had established religion, uh, religions, Christian religions, all the way up until 1833 with Massachusetts. The original intent of the 55 constitutional framers' founding fathers was not the determining factor in religious establishment. Okay, it was demanded by the states during the ratification process. Here's the really sinister part. The religious rights' ultimate aims are to return the U.S. to its Christian origins, which never existed, really, and to eliminate the existing Constitution. They simply want to get rid of it and replace it with biblical law and codify the Ten Commandments under their philosophy of theonomy. And they want to apply the death penalty for offenses against their version of the biblical laws. And these aims are based on the false belief that the U.S. was founded as a Christian nation. Church-state separation, this is not a founding father's issue. Church-state separation was demanded by the states during ratification. Each state had their own ratifying convention, and the members of those conventions demanded inclusion of, of the Bill of Rights and uh, church-state separation. Bill of Rights applied originally only to the federal government and did not limit the state's rights to pass laws. We saw that. The South could still pass laws against saying anything against slavery, for instance. But the 14th Amendment was written to specifically incorporate the Bill of Rights and limit the state's ability to pass contradictory laws. Now, the su Supreme Court has selectively incorporated <coughs> the 14th Amendment. All of the Bill of Rights, each one of those rights, freedom of press, the right to assemble, the right to jury, uh, trial by jury, etc. Each one of those, at different times and places, have been selectively incorporated. Not all of them have, not all states, still have, uh, still allow you to go jury or require the unanimous consent of jury, et cetera. So not all of the Bill of Rights has still been incorporated, and these are being done by Supreme Court decisions, not amendments. So the Supreme Court has the unchecked power to selectively overturn incorporation of any part or parts of the Bill of Rights. It's conceivable that they could say, now, no, the Establishment Clause applies only to the federal government, not to the states. And, and the state, if it wishes, can establish a religion. So the, the key point here is that we need to be very selective about whom we elect to appoint Supreme Court justices. We don't want to work on the Supreme Court, for instance. Okay. And the, another key point, if you look at the, the makeup of the Supreme Court now, there are some very conservative and very young Supreme Court justices, they're going to be affecting our nation for decades. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, we'll entertain a few questions if people would like to uh, ask a question. Uh, thanks for coming. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned, I think, that until recently, four Supreme Court justices were dominions. Who were they? What is the source for that information? Uh, that's, uh, I got it from the internet, and uh, <laughs> I believe it was in uh, Sarah Diamond's book about the uh, Dominionists. Uh, you might check, just Google Sarah Diamond. But who were they? Who were they? Oh, the, the obvious, very conservative ones, Scalia, Thomas, etc. I don't, I don't know the names. I didn't bother to, uh, to memorize the names of the four, but four of them were. And, also, large, large numbers of senators and congressmen. They were very close to ruling the country. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Uh, just a question. Uh, the, 
uh, put yourself in their mindset. And can you answer to me what Christian principles they're talking about? Part of the reason I came today was to hear somebody tell me what, because I haven't done any research on it, but I've wondered they go on about it. So what Christian principles well, as, are as I mentioned, founded on? Uh, as I mentioned, Genesis 1, chapter 1, verse 28, is the one that, that gives mankind dominion. Okay, dominion. And they have taken that and run with it. They have really pushed that envelope. And their idea is that the Bible is literally true, every word of it, and that the Bible should be our law rather than the Constitution. There should be no secular laws, only biblical law. Okay, but what do they point to in our government? Uh, I, I can point to science, the Enlightenment, and its trail of history there leading up to the Constitution. But what do they point out? Well, the Mayflower Compact is one of their biggest. Okay. See, right. right here it says, but that wasn't the founding of the nation. It isn't in the Constitution. Um, and the rest of it, I think they sort of pull out of thin air like they do their creationist ideas uh, when they refute evolution. They, they, they are allowed to make up facts as far as they're concerned. Read, read uh, uh, Conservative Wiki, or Conservapedia. Oh, yeah. They, they simply <laughs> make up their own facts and pull them out of thin air. Just a quick one. Which Bible, uh, which version of the Bible are they picking? I've read three of them from the back myself, and they don't all agree. Well, they tend to be evangelical Protestants, and they tend to use the King James, but that's probably not universal. How do some of these extremists Sort out the, uh, uh, the cases where the sayings of Jesus indicate real differences from the harshness of Old Testament law. It's a skill that husbands learn. It's called selective hearing. <laughs> about love and you know all the good things but if you go to many of the mega churches I know in the Phoenix area at, at the heart of them they are dominionists they believe in political activism they do believe in bringing uh, America back to their roots but they don't say the weird wacky stuff out loud to everyone do you see what I'm saying and when they homeschool their children if everyone knew that if we were able to pull back the curtain talk about the roots of some of the philosophy that goes on behind it. Well, I mean, the whole house of cards would come tumbling down. So, um, so they're following, they're following the, all the good things, and they're, the people at the bottom are, are not aware of all the philosophy that's going in at the highest levels about uh, building this infrastructure and all the donations and everything else. And uh, if you're interested at some, at some point, uh, I have a presentation on uh, Reconstructionist theology and Indianism. So I have heard um, many politicians, even Democrats, say something about democracy to the Middle East. However, the majority of the people are thinking in Sharia law. Now, can you comment on that, please? Well, uh, they have a, a totally different culture and, and uh, mental environment. And to them, it seems natural because religion in their lives is so per pervasive. Look at the furor over this, this film that's been, been produced that uh, insulted the prophet and people are dying because of that. 
So religion is much more ingrained in the Mideast world. They take it very, very seriously. Um, and we take it more seriously than, than other parts of the Western world. For instance, uh, Europe, uh, in, in most of Europe, they think Americans are slightly nuts because we're so attached to religion. So the, the level of religiousness varies from the, the really extreme uh, Islamic person. But we have equally extreme people here. They're the minority here, the Reconstructionists and, and Dominionists. But there are a lot of the Dominionists, and as Anne pointed out, they're, they're, they keep their, their real purpose in the background because it is so bizarre. And uh, in the researching this in the, for the presentation on Dominionism, they expressly tell their people, you know, when, when you're talking to groups, etc., don't cover this far out stuff. As, as Anne said, just talk about the love and let's all hold hands and sing and be very nice to each other and the world will be a better place because of religion. Uh, so they just they, uh, keep it out of sight. Does that answer your question? No. <laughs> okay, let me try again. Well, I was, uh, I wanted you to go toward the democracy aspect. How the hell are those people become becoming democratic without killing each, killing the people who are trying to make a democracy? Well, as we see, they're not. <laughs> there are there are some societies that, at least not yet, are ready for democracy. They have tribal relationships and family and clan and so on. <coughs> and those are the people that they pay attention to and think should dominate. So not so, in our lifetime. Well, I don't I don't have much left, so perhaps yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. Okay. Let's give Dick a big hand again. And